Hi guys, and welcome back to my channel. Welcome to this week's Mental Monday. And boy do I have a video for you. I am going to put a little warning. <clears throat> we are going to be talking about suicide and suicidal thoughts and potentially anything to do with that. We are going to be reacting to a TED Talk called Casually Suicidal. It's a talk given by Sarah Liberty. I will put the link to it below if you want to watch the full thing yourself. Um, I've talked, I feel like, a lot about depression and that whole idea of not always looking like what you expect it to. I have not actually talked a ton about suicide or suicidal thoughts, but I've been kind of wanting to because I feel like it's a really important topic, and I think this is a perfect way to kind of look at that idea to start with. So we're going to be watching the TED Talk and reacting to it. I've never done this before, so... Let's, let's get going on this. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to start off with a joke. What do you call a student of music with a 4.0? Suicidal. <laughs> oh my gosh, you laughed? But I'm sure most of you are very uncomfortable right now. Let's just linger in this discomfort. <laughs> I'm also sure I heard your laugh, so some of you found humor in that. But maybe some of you related to that in one odd way or another. Discomfort, humor, relatability often run hand in hand when we talk about the big scary S word, suicide. My name is Sarah, and everything pertaining to that joke relates to me. I'm currently in my fourth year studying music here. I really do have a 4.0 right now. And I have danced with depression and the very dark, intrusive thoughts that come along with it. As I scroll through social media and hear conversations between people, I realize that suicide is something people are actually joking about and people are actually... Okay. I just want to take a moment to say it is so brave when anybody shares that openly about it. So I already am happy with that and commend her for that. Actually laughing about. It makes me wonder what made suicide such a casual thing to tease about. Well, have I brought some examples? Let's take a stroll through our social media together. Facebook. I'm prepared to die. I want to pick kill myself. I tomatally want to die. I have no raisin to live. I avocado don't want to be alive. I want to corn mit suicide. All right. On to Yik Yak, an app that allows you to anonymously confess things. You can search by region, and I searched under Adelphi's tag. This class is going to be the death of me, smiley face gun emoji. That's a popular one. I'm so lonely. Aw. At that point in the semester where I don't look both ways when I jaywalk. Aw. I sometimes cut my arms, but lately I've been thinking about cutting my wrists. To Twitter. Every day is just 24 hours of me not trying to kill myself. If I kill myself, I'll stop wishing to die. I won't have to stress about the future if I kill myself. I won't be suicidal anymore if I just kill myself. Good morning, I want to die in December of this year. Just reminding everyone that I really want to die October of this year. Maybe you don't want to die, but you don't care if you lived. I'm not even dropping hints that I want to die anymore. Honestly, someone please run me over so, or stab me already. 
Sometimes I want to die for a day just to see who really cares. Oh. Tumblr, SpongeBob. I'll kill the first person that moves. Oh, ugh. SpongeBob again. Me deciding if I want to go to school or kill myself. Wow. Hang in there. A noose pun. Mm. Oh. Forget me not. From this year, this month actually, I'll just kill myself. Bye. And then an Instagram post. I'm not sure if these are lyrics to a song, but if they say to kill yourself, then you will try it. But what intrigued me the most about this Instagram post or the hashtags, suicidal, cutting, depression quotes, bulimia, freak, die, monster. And there were three words in German I translated at the bottom here. Blade, to cut, scratches. I'm a quiet person, so I hear everything. And behind me sat these two girls in the class where our professor was always five minutes late. A says to B, ugh. I'd rather jump out the window than be here. B replies, well, we're only on the second floor. You'd have to swan dive out so your head was the first thing that hit the ground. Then you'd die. Sitting in my statistics class this semester, second week of school, two boys are sitting behind me and one says to the other, this class already makes me want to kill myself. The other one chuckled. Okay. <laughs> One, that was an incredible way of setting up her point she's trying to make. Because <laughs> those were really powerful examples of suicide getting treated really casually. And I think it brings up a great point that there are a lot of ways, like, on an everyday basis that things like suicide, things like depression, things of that nature get so minimized and casually talked about and not treated as seriously. And that desensitizes us. Desensitization is kind of the foundation that's necessary for it to become a bigger problem. If we aren't taking it that seriously, if we aren't paying that much attention to how we're treating it, it's going to be allowed to grow. It's going to be allowed to go unresponded to and dealt with, and we're acting like it's no big deal. Or that you can have those feelings in passing and not actually have it be treated as seriously. And it may be not actually warranting being treated seriously. I made the mistake of assuming that in all of these situations, the people were fine that because they were talking about pain with humor, they were okay. That they did it for a laugh, they did it to relate. But it got me thinking, what if that was their flair? What if instead of laughing, they were screaming? And what was it about having to present their pain through humor? I believe it's because they were uncomfortable actually talking about these hard feelings to discuss. So what do we do if someone actually boldly says, I want to kill myself? We get uncomfortable and retract into our shell and we don't know what to do. Discomfort is something that tore an old best friend of mine and I apart. A few years ago, I actually drove myself to the emergency room in the midst of a panic attack. I learned two things that day. Never drive when you're having a panic attack. <laughs> it's not good. 
And number two, it feels really good to get help. It feels so relieving and wonderful to tell someone, I'm hurting, look at me, help me. Okay, I love that. One, yet, please never drive while you're having a panic attack or major anxiety in any way. Like, just bad idea. Bad idea. But I love how she's twisting this into the other side. She's spinning it into the other side. Talking about her experience getting help. It's so important to be open to getting help. With whatever it is, but particularly with the topic she's talking about, it's so important to get help quickly. And I love that she's sharing this story. Me. I was released from the psychiatric emergency room. I was released from the psychiatric emergency room at 6.30 in the morning. And I was sitting in this ugly green waiting room, waiting for my parents to come pick me up because I didn't feel like driving back. And I realized that people were still coming into the emergency room, that the sun was rising and people were still going about their day. And because it was 6.30 in the morning, my best friend was getting ready for school to start at 7. I call them and to my surprise they pick up because they weren't a morning person. The first thing to fly out of my mouth was, you won't believe the night I had. Can I see you in 12 hours? 12 hours come and go. I'm sitting in their bedroom. At the time, one of my favorite places in the world. It was their bedroom. We made so many great memories there. We had a really comfortable bed and a computer and a piano and a fish tank. Most importantly, my friend and our friendship. I tell them everything that happened, the drive, everything that led up to the thoughts, the actual thoughts I had, and what happened in the hospital. There was silence after I spoke for a solid 20 minutes. My friend looks me in the eye, and I could see a glimmer of confusion. And they say to me, Sarah, you've always known what I thought about people who want to kill themselves. Let them. They're weak, and we're better off without them. I don't talk to my best friend anymore. I don't know where they are. Okay. Never respond to somebody telling you they're suicidal or have suicidal thoughts like that. And I'm really glad she doesn't talk to them anymore. Because that is not somebody that can help her. If you want to know how to properly respond to somebody that tells you that, there's a ton of resources. There's a ton of ways of learning more about how the best way to respond can look like, like what that looks like, what you can use to help them words to say, all of that, the gist of it comes down to being there for them, listening to them, not throwing your opinion at them, not freaking out because they're already feeling anxious and overwhelmed, but just being there with them in whatever way they need, whether they just want to sit there with you, whether they want you to listen, whether they want resources you can share. Um, I, I think it's really important to have those on hand for anybody. Whether you know anybody that significantly struggles with mental health or not, you never know when things like that are going to pop up because it happens to anybody at any time, right? Anybody could be struggling anybody. It is the people that you least expect, usually, that are actually struggling a significant amount. It is always good to be prepared in that way. And I think 
having that on hand and you as somebody close to them that cares about them, knowing how they work, putting those two together can be so powerful for helping somebody. And that can make all the difference in the world to that person. I don't know where they are, what they're doing with their life. And I don't think they're a bad person. We were so young. And if you hadn't dealt with, dealt rather, with mental illness directly, you don't know it. And if you weren't educated properly, how are they supposed to know what to do, what to say, how to feel? Our discomfort is what drove us apart. Discomfort crumbled our relationship. I feel sorry for them. And I feel sorry for every little boy who can't cry and every little girl who can't get angry because they have to keep it inside because if they let it out, they would make the other people uncomfortable and we're told that that's wrong. Discomfort is at the root of all of this emotional turmoil people feel. I love that point. It is true that a lot of the source of the stigma around mental health is the uncomfortability it causes because it's a hard conversation to have. It, it scares you. It pushes you out of your comfort zone. It, it can be just emotionally a lot. And that whole foundation of that needs to crumble. We need to be okay with being uncomfortable. We need to be okay with going to those hard places to fully deal with those issues. And that is the beginning of being able to make real change and that's the beginning of being able to actually help people. And uh, I just, I love that point so much. So, so much. We don't want to share out of the fear it'll hurt someone. And we're too afraid to ask because it just might not be our place. Let someone deal with their sadness alone. It's a journey they have to take alone. Let me tell you, it feels good to share. It feels really good to ask for help. Yes. I actually told a friend of mine recently that I'm trying to start up therapy again. And my friend, a rather intelligent woman can't look at me the same ever since I told her this. I bumped into her a couple of days ago and the conversation went something like this. Hello. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Good. How's it going with your d doctor? I just stared at her for a little while. My therapist is a great woman. That's good. And she wouldn't leave, like she, she wanted to help me, but didn't know how. So I just lingered in the discomfort for a little longer. And I wanted to say, we can grab lunch, the three of us sometime, but I didn't, I just said goodbye. I feel bad for her, how uncomfortable she was with me, her friend. And I feel sorry for this religion teacher I had when I was in middle school. We went to after school religion class. She was an older woman. And one day she taught the class that people who commit suicide go straight to hell. That there was no chance of them getting into heaven because they took away the most precious gift God can give you, life. I agree with her that life is beautiful. But I feel sorry for her because she was so uncomfortable to see the pain a person is in when they actually end their life. Mm -hmm. She'll never understand that people can hurt so bad that they end a life. We need to stop oversharing online and undersharing in real life and start reaching out 
okay, I love those examples. Um, it, it just speaks so much to how important education and awareness and really helping people understand is because that's at the heart of the discomfort with it. It's, it's trying to understand that gets people stuck. And I think she really hits that home really well. And I loved what she said about we need to stop oversharing online and undersharing in person. I think in our culture of social media and the internet and doing so much within that realm, it can be easy to have that feel like we are reaching out for help or we are sharing or it's actually tangibly doing something. And in reality, we need to be sharing with those in our everyday life that know us, that we have a personal relationship with. I think we lose that actual connection and the real full spectrum reaching out for help when we use social media as our outlet. Now, I say that as somebody that shares online all the time and I've said that <laughs> making these videos is basically therapy at times, but that doesn't replace that when the camera's off, I'm also talking to my husband about those things, and even in greater detail, like sharing way more with him than I would ever put on camera. I'm sharing with my friends and my family, and it's not just this that I'm sharing with. And there's a difference. Reach out to others that you may see in pain. Reach out for yourself. Ask for help. Share your emotions. Because there is something so beautiful about being human that we have all of these emotions. And yes, feeling happiness and joy and love up here are a wonderful thing. But there is something also wonderful about feeling the depths of despair and hopelessness. It's a part of the human experience, and being human is something we have to embrace, and that especially includes discomfort. If you see someone in pain, just ask, are you okay? It's not hurting anyone, I promise. Just know that some girl with frizzy hair and glasses told you that, I promise. It's a weird world we live in. Why am I so comfortable to write online, but not to share in real life? I want to change that. Because, you know, the CDC reports that someone around the world kills themselves every 40 seconds. And that suicide rates have done nothing but increase in America since 1999. That scares me. It scares me that I lost a friend, that the point of view from a friend about me has changed. It's incredible. I think everything I'm trying to say can be summarized by a quote from my favorite fictional history teacher, Corey Matthews of Boy Meets World and Girl Meets World. <laughs> yes. He once taught his students that the secret of life is that people change people. I'd like to add on to what Mr. Matthews said. I believe people change people because people need people. We need to embrace being human and all of the beauty and ugliness that comes along with it. Thank you. Okay. Final thought on that last part. It was so good. This whole thing was so good. I loved every, everything she said, every point she made, the way she shared it. It was amazing and awesome, and this we need more of this. 
do not be afraid to reach out for help or to be the one reaching out to somebody that you think might need help. Check on your friends. It doesn't have to be anything more complicated than, are you okay? How are you doing? How are you feeling? And giving them the opportunity to open up and share and connect and, and make sure that they're okay. It's not going to hurt anybody. It's not going to do anything if you do that and they reject it and don't want to share. But you gave them the opportunity. You offered a safe environment for them to open up. And that is so powerful. If you want to go watch this TED Talk without me popping in, like I mentioned in the beginning, it'll be in the description box. I, I loved this so much. I hope you guys enjoyed this too. I would love to hear your thoughts on this. I would love to hear what struck you the most. And yeah, just your thoughts, any questions, anything at all. Leave it in the comments below. I really hope you enjoyed this. If you want to see more videos like this, let me know that as well. Make sure you give this video a like and are subscribed and have notifications on. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Bye.